Welcome to Welcome to Silicon Valley Buzz, the TV show where we discuss happenings in this, the most fertile spot on the planet for new ideas. I'm Seth Shostak, your host. The producer is Janet Wu. Well, cybersecurity, far from your thoughts? Maybe it shouldn't be, because there are some who say that cybersecurity is a vulnerability that may, in fact, be more important in terms of your gusto grabbing lifestyle than actual terrorism. And to give us the inside look at what cybersecurity is doing these days, what the threat is, and uh, what we're doing about it, is my guest, Ali Golshan. And Ali is the co-founder and chief architect at CyFord. Ali, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Okay, look, uh, how severe is this cybersecurity threat? I mean, you know, I'm worried about my hard drive, but I back it up. So do I have to worry about this? Yeah, um, it, it's kind of an interesting field. Um, for you as a as a independent kind of home user, there isn't really too much to be afraid of at this moment. There's a lot of drive-by downloads. And what that means is there's the general polluted web that is eventually going to send something towards you. But in a larger scheme of things, majority of the truly sophisticated attacks are very much still focused on large IPs, intellectual property companies, governments, uh, financial institutions. So the, the severity of the attack is much more infrastructural um, less focused on the end user at this point, but it is certainly changing towards that. Well, give me a little bit of the history here, because, I mean, when did these viruses begin to emerge? I, I remember back in 1983, <laughs> I remember that, uh, you know, IBM brings out the PC, and suddenly yeah. having a PC on your desk wasn't so rare anymore. Uh, but as I recall, very few of these machines are actually hooked up to one another. So was there really any threat then? When, when did the viruses actually make their appearance? Sure. Um, viruses as a theory have existed since the 60s. Um, the first true documented uh, version of a worm actually happened in 1988. Um, but if you think about really the, the growth of malware, as we call it, which is malicious software, really started in 90s, towards the end of the 90s and early 2000s, with the, um, the advancements of technology around networking, the internet, the web itself, basically interconnectivity caused an enormous amount of propagation possibilities, which is how these malicious objects can actually move from one machine to another. So it's hard to do it with floppy disks and stuff like that. Absolutely. I mean, these days it's done still through USBs in a much more sophisticated targeted attack. But in the traditional days, you needed a much larger platform to be able to propagate these types of attacks, be able to understand really how effective they are. So in the 90s, 90s gave rise to what we called worms, which were these objects that really manipulated and moved as quickly as possible through your networks. And they caused an enormous amount of bandwidth um, withheld essentially in the environment, which meant they plugged up networks. They actually caused an enormous amount of bandwidth issues. They were much more for notoriety, essentially. Hackers wanted to actually put their stamp on a particular site or a particular company. Well, well, well who was doing this? It sounds like malevolent nerds, if you will. Propeller heads with too much time on their hands? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, there was actually a term called script kiddies, which were people just writing simple scripts, you know, trying to get into various environments and making a claim around it. Um, because there was such little amount of IP, intellectual property, or truly confidential data available through those particular channels, there was much less incentive for government organizations or crime, crime, organized crime groups essentially to, to actually organize an attack in this particular fashion, in a cyber, cyber essentially attacking fashion. Um, so it was much more for making a name for yourself, basically, you know, coming up with a handle and being known in the underground realm. Um, as we hit the 2000s, that started to shift drastically. Well, well, tell me about that, because in the beginning, it sort of sounds like graffiti artists. Yeah. They're doing it, you know, just to impress other graffiti artists. Right. But in the late 90, 1990s, is that when you said it began to switch? And, and, and why was that? Was there just money to be made? And if so, how? Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually, that's exactly it, which is um, the underground economy in itself has become a major driving factor in why these attacks are taking place. So initially, it was very much, like you said, the graffiti artists who can make a bigger name, a better name for themselves. You know, how many systems can you get into? That was really the telltale sign for hackers and for crackers, essentially. Um, where the shift happened is as companies start to consolidate a lot of their systems, they start to move a lot of their intellectual property, their confidential data into systems that were actually accessible by the external resources through the web, through mail, they can actually be targeted towards that. So the, the environment shifted from just making a name from yourself to actually becoming an economy where you can actually make financial returns depending on who you actually target. C 
can, can you give me an example of how, as a hacker, I, I'm just really good with the computers, I understand computer code, I'm just wired that way, if you will. <laughs> okay, how can I make money from, from writing this malware, which, sure. which sounds like something I might have in my kitchen? Sure, so I'll give you a perfect example. Um, there's, a, there's a platform called the Russian Business Network, and obviously by definition it's hosted out of Russia. Um, this thing used to be a legitimate, well, semi-legitimate internet service provider in the 90s. As they start to see the shift towards hackers conducting these massively orchestrated attacks, they actually became a platform for launching these attacks. So what they do is they actually recruit highly skilled engineers, and that was really the shift, which was script kiddies, you know, teenagers or people doing this for notoriety purposes, to actually very skilled engineers and scientists constructing pieces of attacks as a larger scale of an attack. So the reason this became very effective was now that they had a platform to be able to launch these attacks from, it created an enormous amount of continuity as well as information exchange, where if one hacker understood how a system was vulnerable, they can exchange that piece of information to a thousand hackers. And then the information themselves was actually being traded or actually sold in the underground market, depending on what the information was. Was it credit card information? Was it social security numbers? Or more importantly, was it design and intellectual property that actually belonged to a company? That was really the driving factor. Uh, well, an example of property, I mean, I can understand they can break into I don't know, maybe American Express's uh, facility, their computer facility in, in New York or wherever it is, they get all these credit card numbers, that's clearly worth money. Mm -hmm. But property? Sure. So when we talk about intellectual property, we're really talking about high value design or source code. So if you think about, for example, um, an institution in Far East where they're trying to actually compete with a chip company here like an Intel um, or an AMD. Being able to actually extract their patents, their designs before they really hit the open market, before they've had a chance to commercialize or protect that, they can actually extract or exfiltrate that from your system and they're basically bypassing years and billions of R&D. So it's not necessarily to go after them head to head or be able to go and sell that further. It actually could be a huge incentive for the company or for the group themselves to create a competitive edge. Um, if you can bypass years and billions of R&D by basically investing a few million into an organized attack and carry it out over a six to nine month period, then you're substantially ahead of that game. Wow, sounds like a better investment than being on the, de <laughs> the, the defending end. Now, now when did companies uh, see that there was a market for protecting firms and individuals against this? Were, were they originally there just to protect you from the kind of virus that might erase files in your hard drive, or did they come in when the companies became vulnerable? Sure. Um, so the concept of cybersecurity and software security has actually existed since the late 90s. Uh, well, sorry, late 80s, early 90s. Um, so that has always existed to be able to protect the end users. There was always infections that were being passed around whether it was through files, whether it was through applications, games. Um, where the real driving factor came in as far as innovation in the security industry went was really mid to late 90s, where there was a majority of attacks actually coming for a very specific purpose, not necessarily just notoriety, to be able to exfiltrate something. So what we saw was the whole concept of fear selling, where corporations were spending an enormous amount of money to protect themselves from possible compliance issues or for possible, for example, um, panic within their investors, understanding that something was actually taken from the company where it shouldn't have been. That was really the spark the security industry needed to start creating a lot of innovative technologies to prevent this type of attack. And it's a big industry. If I drive down 101, I look at McAfee, they seem to be <laughs> colonizing new buildings all the time. That's right. It's actually growing quite rapidly. And as a subset, there's been other sectors that have been created. So if you think about security, it was much more of a consolidated group. Now it's starting to expand into various subsections. You have identity management, you have things like intrusion prevention and detection. Basically, as as technology itself grew, as introduction of new operating systems, new applications, new platforms, new ways of communications came about, there had to be new innovative solutions to protect each one of these phases. And that was really the key point, which is why these large companies moved away from a single solution to multiple solutions to be able to cover all this essential footprint. Well, I, I would think that if I'm ABC company and I've got to worry about this because I've got information, intellectual property that I need to protect, I could have my in-house guys trying to figure out how to defend against this stuff, or I could hire a company that that's their business. Sure. So clearly that would be a better thing, but I mean, can they really do it? Can they keep up? I mean, who, who's better? Are they the defenders or the offenders? <laughs> well, as the defenders, we're certainly trying. Um, I think one fundamental issue is that if you're on the defending side, you always have to succeed. You have to succeed 100 out of 100 times, where when you're on the attacking side, you only need one infiltration to really be able to, you know, knock down do all damage. the chips. Yeah. Exactly. And that's really the, the fundamental issue, which is 
we're, we have to have a perfect batting record where they just have to find the weakest link in the chain. And sometimes the weakest link in the chain is not necessarily your preventative technology. It could be the human behavior, the human interaction you take advantage of. And that's the critical nature that over the last four or five years has become a predominant aspect of the attacking phase. Now, you said, at least I believe you said, that in 2011, the amount of malware, if you will, malevolent software mm -hmm. exceeded the amount of good software being produced. Now, is that really true? It is and true. And how do you know? Right. <laughs> um, so it is true, but th there's a fundamental point that needs to be made. The reason that's the case is um, malware came up with a technology, or I, say, I guess attacking um, uh, organizations, which was traditional security solutions were designed based on a set of things called signatures and heuristics, which meant you see a particular virus, you look at its construction, you know, what the source code looked like, you'd extract that, you build it into a signature. Next time you saw a file, you'd compare it against that and be able to tell. It's, it's like kind if of I took, a fingerprint kind of Exactly. Thing. I took a picture of you, next time I saw you, I could finger, you know, I can detect that, that was you. So what the attacking industry did was they created things called metamorphic, polymorphic engines. These are essentially aspects of the engine of the code that actually randomize the code construction and sequence. So when they come across a signature, they look completely different. It'd be like if you put on a fake mustache and a different color hair. On a traditional environment, it'd be very det difficult to detect. So when you have one single piece of malware, for example, let's take Zeus, which is a great example. It's a financial trojan. According to the FBI, it caused over $6 billion of damage last year. It goes through its morphing capacity, and it has something like 70,000 different versions out there. Then you're really getting into an environment in a race which you can't win just by fingerprinting someone. You have to come up with other things like heuristics and essentially behavior analyzers to stay with it. But that's one reason malicious software exceeded healthy software. Well, well when, my, when my virus protection package runs, <laughs> and it does every Sunday when I want to use the computer the most, it seems, uh, but you know, it goes through every file, but it's going through them very quickly. I mean, I see the, you know, the counter going up. It's obviously not spending a whole lot of time mm -hmm. on every file. I mean, is it just looking for patterns or is it doing this, uh, this deeper test that you've talked about? No, um, traditionally all end user machines, consumer essentially solutions are very much signature or pattern checkers. So oh. they take the pattern database they have and that's the live update you end up seeing, which is the new signatures downloaded to your machine. And then they obviously go and compare that against every file you see. The issue with that is that's selected in a probabilistic fashion, which is what are the highest likelihood of patterns that hit you. So if you have those anomalous ones, they very, very much go undetected. I, I got to say, I mean, this is all so reminiscent of <laughs> fighting disease. Maybe, <laughs> I mean, it's like developing the next flu vaccine. We'll, we'll decide on what are the more likely strains of this virus that are going to get you and we'll protect against those. Absolutely. And there's actually two concepts of an attack methodology. There's one which is the truly targeted attack. There's this term called APT, it's a very commercialized term which stands for Advanced Persistent Threats, which really means that the attack is meant to stay in your system and run without noticing it for not months, but possibly years at a time. They're just sitting in there. Exactly, sitting there collecting information, pushing that information out. Um, so it becomes the same notion as when do you understand this thing has gone from dormant to active and is actually exfiltrating information. Um, the key thing is attacking methodologies and applications these days have an entire life cycle, same way a disease does, where they go through you know, gestation, information collection, distribution, implementation, and then extraction of data. So they've almost in a, in a very systematic way infiltrate your environment and then exfiltrate data. You know, I, I mean, this sounds like the fight against cancer. <laughs> In fact, maybe it'll work that way. Maybe, you know, the kind of work you do will lead to the cure for cancer. I mean, I don't know. Uh, is it lucrative if I were one of these guys, you know, uh, developing malware? Um, could I sell it to somebody else or do I just launch it out there and hope that it gets something that's valuable for me? Um, so the more um, common methodology is that you actually go and sell it to someone for a particular purpose. But that actually, that environment in itself has shifted somewhat, which is you just don't go randomly building these types of attacks. You're actually recruited to build a very specific part of an attack because it's part of a larger attacking landscape. So you're hired for, for a job. Absolutely. And I'll give you a perfect example. I had a chance to speak to uh, two very um, talented Russian engineers. Um, they were both um, graduates of a very um, prominent technical institute in Russia, masters in computer science and electrical engineering. And they mentioned that um, when they were working for a legitimate company, they were making roughly two to three thousand dollars, US dollars a month. Um, they're actually building financial malware now. And they're making somewhere between twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars a month. So these guys don't wake up in the morning and say, "How can I be a bad guy?" They wake up and say, "How can I use my talent to basically produce financial returns for myself?"
My gosh. Okay. I, you, does McAfee hire these people? I mean, if, if it finds <laughs> them, I mean, I would think that there'd be a you know a regular flight from uh, the, the centers. Of the, are, are they mostly in Russia these days? Um, they're kind of all over the place. Russia, a lot of the Eastern European countries house a lot of the more independent organized crime groups. Um, there are a lot more state-sponsored attacks that come out of um, China, um, a lot of Middle, Middle Eastern countries, and some of the obviously um, uh, Russian sectors. Uh, but there's really a balance between the two. There's the the organized uh, the organized crime groups, which are much more um, much more interested in financial returns. Then there's the government and state sponsored attacks, which are much more interested in intelligence and counterintelligence. Actually, well, we want to get into that. But but let me just ask you, what what is this costing? I mean, I know what it costs when my computer begins to slow down or if something awful really happens and mm -hmm. you know I can't can't get to my data. I mean, I have some idea. That's that's a personal cost, but financially, it's not terribly significant. Sure. But how significant is this problem overall, I mean, in the economy? Right. Um, th you know, th the numbers are very rough. It's very difficult to nail down one number and say this is a true cost of this particular damage. There was a um, uh, Pomen Pomenon, uh, which is a research institute, actually came out with a number a couple of years ago where they were saying that the damages from cyber attacks is roughly getting to be a trillion dollars globally a year. So if you think about how that amount of financials extracted from traditional economies is actually affecting day-to-day -day users. It's, it's a federal it's, budget. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> So you're talking about a substantial effect. Now, that might be in various different ways. So if you talk about, for example, an intellectual property company that has their source code stolen, therefore they have to re-architect the system. Their next version might be incrementally more expensive. Or an insurance company might actually pull that into your premium. A government sector might actually incorporate it within your taxes. At this point, there isn't a very clear and visible mark to say this is how it's impacting every single end user. And that's why it's mostly gone unnoticed because you don't really notice it in your day-to-day -day life. It's like a sales tax that you didn't know about. I mean, it's a sort of a hidden tax. Right. Yeah, but a but trillion dollars. Now, I understand that the federal government, the U.S. federal government, is planning to spend $15 billion over the next, what, three years? Is that That's right, up to 2015. Yeah, so $5 billion a year for defense against this sort of stuff. Now, they're, they're not worried about protecting my hard drive, I assume. <laughs> Probably but, not. <laughs> but, but, you know, that's not insignificant. I mean, NASA's mm -hmm. budget is maybe twice that, but only twice that, and everybody think, thinks that NASA takes a lot of money. I mean, it's, it's costing a lot. What, what about the fraction of uh, companies or industries that are affected? I, I've heard it said that, you know, there are only two kinds of companies, those that have already <laughs> had to fend this off and those that will have to fend it off. Right. Um, there's also a different way of looking at it. Those have been infiltrated and those who don't know they've been infiltrated. Oh, so everybody's <laughs> already been affected. Yeah. To some degree or not. Because, there, again, we talk about the life cycle and there's, there's multiple stages to this life cycle. Attackers traditionally don't take a brute force attack where if they're coming after a, a large enough organization or a company where they would originate attack from... Um, and a location essentially that would be very easily found. So there's proxying. And what that means is you might just take an entire company as collateral damage and use it as a launching pad where their reputation, their general longevity, their business continuity is affected just to get to somebody else where may they, they may be a partner of the initial company. So those are really the collateral damages you end up seeing in this well, environment. But do you mean that, that it's a demonstration? Or do you mean that having successfully done this, now we can go after the real... You know, it's actually victim. what it is is they use company A as a platform to attack company B just oh. to remove themselves one other stage from that eventual end target. And, and what are the companies spending on this? If the government's spending five billion a year, are the companies doing something similar or more or less? Yeah, companies are. Um, it it really depends where they position themselves in this overall market. If you think about some of the larger IP companies, technology companies, where they understand their entire business continuity is dependent on a series of source codes, um, they're obviously investing a lot more into this infrastructure, into cutting edge technology, rearchitecting their you know traditional networks into more advanced technology and um, networks, but. To most of it, um, companies are still unaware or unwilling to accept the scale of the damage that could possibly be inflicted on them. Also because there's really, there hasn't been to this point any regulations that forces companies to disclose the type of damage or the type of infections that's taken place. So by that factor, having to inform their customers, their investors as to what damage has taken place. Because that hasn't existed, it hasn't been enough motivation for companies to actually move past that. Uh, what has been the motivation for spending has been things around compliance, PCI, where it essentially becomes a check mark and they en manage to move past you know, their security audit essentially into next year's budget and increase it exponentially, not really taking proactive action to actually stop this. It's just like you know, proactive versus reactive essentially. 
My goodness, I, I would think that your job prospects are probably pretty good. <laughs> it's not bad. It's, it sounds like you're in the, in the right business to be in. Now, now, what about national security? Because, you know, I've heard it said that uh, cyber attacks are, you know, the, it's the next battleground, and actually it's a greater threat to us than conventional terrorism. Mm -hmm. uh, terrorism. I, is that really true? Um, it's becoming that way. And well, how would it work? What, sure. what, what could they do? Sure. Um, so let's, let's take a perfect example, which was the, um, in 2008, the Russian-Georgian warfare, where there was traditional warfare and then there was cyber warfare incorporated within that. And part of that was to cut communication between various departments that used essentially cyber technology to coordinate their defense, their response, their reaction, their general strategy. So once you start to disrupt that particular platform, then you're starting to actually kind of take them um, the approach of divide and conquer. And that's really what we're talking about going forward. Now, the larger issue is, as we start to bring a lot of technology into things like, um, for example, smart grids or um, the water treatment plants, you're starting to also introduce a lot more vulnerability where remote access and remote control can actually be conducted from anywhere in the world, essentially, you're talking about. And that is a fundamental issue, and that's a fundamental problem that we're going to have to deal with at some point over the next few years. Could they really interfere with the power grid and shut down all of the, you know, the, turn off all the lights in Los Angeles? <laughs> um, they can certainly disrupt it. They can certainly make, um, they, they can make, <laughs> it, it's, it's hard to kind of get into it because obviously a lot of it is around national security and how much of it I can disclose. But all what right. I will say is that the, I mean, the this problem is a legitimate exists threat. and it's a very legitimate threat. The proof of concept exists through a demonstrable what's called penetration testing, which is essentially black box testing of the systems, we have already proven that these systems are vulnerable and they can be taken down. So they do testing in the same way that it's said that terrorists, you know, test the TSA system by sending some guy through it doesn't really have a weapon, but you know, he has the sorts of things that could hide a weapon. Absolutely. There's there's a, there's an issue that we which is um, we're at a massive disadvantage, which is as a security professional, if you're conducting these types of testings, you have a very specific parameter and you have a kind of a ceiling that you have to hit, which means when you're conducting your penetration testing or your general analytics, um, which is essentially the assessment of the network, you can't go past a certain amount, which is pushing the system to a certain point, which is the breaking point. Attackers don't have that in their mindset. They'll push it until it keels over and extract what they need. Can, can you tell me, I believe that there was a story in which uh, some people used a very, very clever I think it was a potato gun uh, scheme for, in fact, infecting some, some organization. Can you tell me anything about that? Sure. Uh, so a few years ago, um, I was doing consulting as part of incident response and forensics, which is usually after an infiltration happens and the company becomes aware of it, which sometimes is months, if not years, after the actual attack. They bring in a team to conduct digital forensics and cyber forensics as to what happened. Mm -hmm. um, this particular organization was an exceptionally sophisticated defense contractor, um, massive uh, campuses in Midwest. Uh, I went out there, we conducted roughly three weeks of forensics, incident response, and uh, general data They had data been collection. infected. That's right. Uh, so we found the initialization of the vector of uh, attack, which was it was introduced from a, with a USB. Uh, we found which applications it was targeting, which systems, what types of data. What we could not figure out is how this ap actual malicious application was introduced within the physical environment. We just could not come to that conclusion. I mean, nobody could get in through the front gate and put something in your USB port. Exactly. So um, after this entire investigation concluded, the information was handed over to the Secret Service, to the FBI, and the Department of Defense, we were called just from a general informative, uh, information session about three months later. We were brought back and they showed us on video that at roughly two in the morning, a truck drove up to their outermost campus um, fence. These two guys with masks got out and took out USBs with potato guns, shooting them into the actual parking lot. Yeah, the thumb drives. That's right. They're shooting thumb drives into the parking lot of the defense facility. That's right. And that's really what we talk about the human element, because people came in in the morning, picked up the USB stick, thinking somebody dropped it, went into the building, into this heavily secured building, and plugged in USBs. And it's actually, that was one of the stages in, corporate, in um, correlation with some of the other attacks on the government sector that started to push some USB use out of that environment. Wow. Now, <laughs> that, that's remarkable. I mean, that's so clever and so simple. But I suppose being clever sometimes means that it is simple. Exactly. You want to say anything about Stuxnet? I think a lot of people have heard about <laughs> that. You know, that, that sounds like, well, in some cases, this might be a good thing to do. Sure. Um, so what I can disclose and talk about from Stuxnet is really the fundamental problem it caused, which was it created a proof of concept and it created a proof of workability essentially with this type of malware. And what I mean by that is in academia there's always been theoretical solutions and architectures as how you can attack these types of systems, these SCADA systems that control nuclear power plants, that control centrifuges and how quickly they spin and what their velocity is. Um, 
what Stuxnet did was it proved that software can actually affect hardware in a very, very integral way. And Stuxnet, in a way, wasn't fully successful because this attack was, was meant to run for a very long period of time. Uh, it was designed to disable the Iranian enrichment of uranium for producing weapons, right? That's right. Yeah. But it, it was somewhat successful, right? I mean, they, they had to replace a lot of centrifuges. Absolutely. Uh, but the failure was, if, if it hadn't been discovered, another nine months down the road when the system came back up, it would crash again. And they would attribute that to faulty products, to bad, badly written software, to generally badly designed architecture or topology. So it was and found too soon. Exactly. This thing would have continued over and over again until obviously driven out of the environment. Okay. So, Ali, we're getting close to the end of the show, and I want to ask you what the long-term outlook here is. I mean, <laughs> okay. I, I can see that I ought to bet on your career, but what I want to know is, you know, is there an end to this? I mean, is technology capable, even in principle, of fixing this problem? Well, technology is certainly making an enormous um, step towards where this problem is right now. I think that security industry became a little too... Um, a little too passive in regards to how they dealt with this particular technology. But now that we've started to see the scale, um, the security industry and the general technology industry's response has become quite quick and a lot of innovation is taking place. But to look at it in a long-term basis, if I give you incentive with really very little repercussion and a chance of being discovered, but exceptionally high returns from a financial standpoint, how likely would it be for you to deter from conducting these types of attacks? Yeah, it's sort of like the war on drugs. Maybe you can never win this. Right. I, well, well, I got to say, Ali, that uh, in the movie Independence Day, you may remember <laughs> this, Jeff Goldblum saves Earth from right. an alien attack by uploading a software virus into the Klingons, well, I guess they weren't Klingons, the aliens' computers. Now, I got to say, I never thought that would work, but it at least shows how important cybersecurity can be. It merely mm -hmm. saved the Earth. So uh, I, I guess, uh, what, what's your advice to, to our viewers here? Um, the advice is using a lot of rational and logical sense actually goes a long way. Um, you know, there's a huge aspect of thing, uh, attacking methodology, which is spear phishing these days, sending links or click on this document, that document, you've just won the jackpot. So using, you know, spear logic, phishing, exactly. Um, using logic and ration as an end user tends to protect you from majority of the stuff that's out there. As far as co corporations and go governments go, it's really going to take an enormous step on the, on the defensive side. And I think one issue is that Attackers don't have to have a five-year financial model where companies have to be able to describe how we're going to make money over a long period of time. And you're kind of held to that, essentially. So sometimes it prevents innovation, but we're doing our best. Well, Ali Golshan, I want to thank you so much. I, I guess the, the, the take-home message is make sure your computer gets its flu shots. <laughs> That's right. And if you work for the government, you know, hire this guy. I don't <laughs> know. Well, that's it for tonight. I'm Seth Shostak for Silicon Valley Buzz, and I hope that you will join us next month. We'll be talking again about things happening here in the Silicon Valley where, let's face it, it's all happening.